We're going to turn next tonight here to the mysterious disappearance of a champion diver. She could dive deeper and stay down longer than almost anyone else. She is considered to be one of the greatest athletes ever in what is one of the world's deadliest extreme sports, free diving. After two days of intense search efforts, the world's best free diver is presumed dead. Molchanova holds 41 world records and was a 23-time world champion in free diving. Spanish emergency services suspended the underwater search for missing freediving champion Natalia Molchanova on the 5th of August. Never take a dive for granted. You don't know what you don't know what dive is going to be your last. It's, it's a feeling. It's a, since I'm a, since I'm a children, or maybe a baby, I don't know. I've always been attracted to the sea. I always felt uh, a connection, like if it was um, uh, calling me, you know, like if. And I always had to go somehow to to swim to, and uh, I always wanted to to make that connection happening. Uh, often and more often and I think this is one of the most re the reason I, 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 I am a freediving instructor is that it's this need of the connection, this need of, uh, of being part of, uh, of, of the ocean, of uh, you feel a part of, uh, of uh, something, something bigger than, than myself and you feel somehow con connected to many things. As well I have this inner peace when my heart is slowing down a lot uh, I feel uh, free. I feel at peace, and I, it's yeah, it's. I feel connected with myself. So, do you remember the urge to breathe come from which gas? Um, not too sure. Uh, I think it was. CO2, right? Yeah, the urge to breathe comes from the from the CO2 uh, going up in your body. Here you start holding a breath, so the oxygen will start dropping bit by bit, and the CO2 uh, uh, increasing rate. Increasing the, the urge to breathe is coming due to the increasing CO2 in, inside the blood. Mm -hmm. Here we're gonna have the contraction. So the diaphragm starts contracting. Here you have time, and you have double the time here before you get into the uh, hypoxia, hypoxia danger zone. Exactly. In front of you, and then boom. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do it one more, one more time. It's a really weird It's a real move, but once. Yes? Like that. Like that. And, and you can also bend a little bit your hands like this to grasp a little bit more water. So what, what I do when I hold my breath, basically, is I try to relax myself as fast as, as possible. I try to let go of uh, every, every tension in my body. I start to do a full body scan. Leave your hands, let your hands drop, and just relax, relax your arms. So I try to relax my muscles in my face, and I go down in my body, my shoulders, my neck, my arms, the, um, the chest, the abdomen, and the hips, legs, etc. Relax your abs. And then, uh, once this is done, I, I really try to, to visualize a, a place where, where I've been before and where I felt really, really relaxed. And I visualize that place. I try to remember everything. 
I try to remember the, the light between the trees. I, I try to remember the noise. If it's like here, like the, the birds. Um, I try to remember the, the smell of flowers. Uh, I try to remember every single detail, every senses. And sometimes I feel like I can levitate away from my body and I'm free to travel wherever I want, all over the world, where any place I've been is kind of accessible to me again. Um, so I do that connection with that place again. It's, it's, really, it's really nice. <laughs> and somehow you lose notion of time when you do that. And, um, when, for example, when I did my seven minutes in, in, Thail in Thailand, when they told me I have done seven minutes, I couldn't believe them. I was like, this is impossible. And no, no, that was it. So yeah, it's really impressive how, yeah, this, it's, it's a kind of meditation state. But yeah, this is my thing, the visu visualization, I think. It works well with me. Hey, let's be I've, I've always enjoyed the idea of sort of like going above, above your own limits, you know. <laughs> I'm still a bit panicking from time to time, you know. My finning is not perfect and my duck dive is still terrible. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but uh, yeah, this is, uh, I think this is the idea and this is pretty much where I am right now. I'm still, you know, getting tangled into the little, you know, perfection or imperfection I need to work on really. Ama Fishing Village, famous for its Awabi fisher girls. It is a place where the people and the sea are one, where, some Japanese say, the people are really fish in human form. Ama women always remain at once bold and shy. Shy not because they are naked. In Japan there is no shame in nakedness. It is natural, and to us what is natural is healthy and good. Thus, the men and the women live their lives against the sea, beneath the sea, taking what life they can from it, hoping from life will come life. Freediving has been around for millennia, um, but obviously it was born of necessity. People were looking for, uh, for goods, for food or for sponge. Um, and the earliest evidence of sponge fishermen is, uh, is written down by Plato, so it's obviously going back a very long way. Um, there's evidence that the Amma um, have been fishing for pearls for about 2,000 years. It's largely the women that are involved in the collection as well, rather than the men. Um, I don't think they're diving particularly deep, but they're diving repetitively for long, long days, um, fishing for pearls, so it's, it's probably really, really, really hard work. It's not an easy thing to do. It wasn't until the 50s, probably, that the, the the fishermen started making bets about how deep that they could get. It started in Italy, I think. And, um, and then sort of that's where competitive freediving was born, really. New style fishermen came from all parts to compete in the underwater championship of Great Britain. There were three starting points along the coast near Swanage, and all had to wear the regulation gear. That did not include artificial breathing apparatus, so of course the men were allowed to go into the water as often as they liked during the five hours of the contest. So the civilian-type frogmen were very soon exploring the depths. It was only a matter of minutes before the first fish was speared. The more ambitious catch, a conger eel. It's a much less passive sport than rod and line angling. You don't wait for the fish, you go down and get them. The prize for the largest victim was won by Ron Berniston. He came from nearby Bournemouth, so he knows the waters round here. How long is it going to take fish to realise that spear-carrying frogmen are not friends? I think it was in 1966, a man called Enzo Milk was the first guy below 50 metres. The society of consumers, thanks to God, still in the sea, at least in the depths of the sea, has not yet arrived. I hope it will not arrive. But I would like 
che andassero in fondo al mare animati da... Ha kind of disproved uh, how science, scientists thought of, of freediving. They didn't believe that humans could go that deep. They thought that their lungs would be crushed and that would be it. They'd die under the, you know, under the weight of the water. Too many years later, that Jacques Mayol was the first guy to 100 meters, completely changing the way that we we understand freediving. I think we're we're quite natural freedivers, human beings. Right then. Right, so let's walk. And then the fins go on beside the in, when we're actually down at the sea. I used to I used to teach scuba diving. Um, and I was working during the winters in warmer places. And one day I saw a lady swim down to a deep wreck with a monofin on and came and waved at us and I was like, wow, that's amazing, I'd love to be able to do that. As you start to descend on your dive, the first part of it is um, you have to swim quite hard to overcome your natural buoyancy. But as you descend, you'll start to become negatively buoyant, which means that you'll, you'll start to sink. And it really is the closest thing that you can get to flying. So there's only a little bit of swimming involved and then the rest of it's a lot of sinking and relaxing into that kind of meditative feeling. But you have to be very present. If you're thinking about you know, being late for work or your shopping list or something like that, it's not going to work. I think overwhelmingly it's, it's a peaceful activity, it's about tranquility and about understanding yourself and understanding the marine environment and I think um, the perception of it is, is that it's a very extreme sport but actually it's much more like yoga and it's a very personal practice. It may be in an extreme environment but it's not an extreme sport. What happened to Natalia was a, a real tragedy because it wasn't on one of her competition dives or one of these like majorly deep extreme dives that she was doing that she went missing. She was coaching a couple of um, not very experienced divers and they came across some current and she went missing at sea. It's just a, a really sad, sad thing that happened and we all miss her terribly. Sadly, most of the media around freediving is when something bad happens. Um, they don't celebrate uh, when somebody performs a world record or goes deeper than anyone has, has been before into the water. They, they report on the, the, the most recent tragedy, which is a real shame, I think. little techniques basically that uh, are not natural that you sort of like need to think about it would be the biggest challenge uh, when I think that's you know that's it's gonna be the biggest challenge for me basically but I'm sure I'll get there it's just a matter of coming back and then back again <laughs> T'as fait le duck dive devant, devant, la, devant la corde au lieu de, fait, au lieu de faire euh, derrière. Je ne sais pas ce que tu fais, mais c'est trop bizarre. So look, I'll show, I'll show your, you. Your uh, body fights the, 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 holding, the fact that you're holding your breath. And, uh, uh, it's really hard for some people to, to get over this mental block. But just a little bit of knowledge uh, is key to, for people to understand oh, listen, ah, ok, I can stay calm just get over the urge to breathe and stay a little bit more. And this is what we do. We give the, a little knowledge so that people can, can be free.
very good. <laughs> this time, make sure you pick up the. I've held six away. national records in static apnea. Um, and I've been competing for the UK since 2007. My personal best for a static apnea, is, which is a timed breath hold, is a little bit over seven minutes. And um, in terms of deep diving, my personal best is 60 metres. Um, and that's swimming down with a, with a monofin and swimming back up again. Um, I think for me the greatest mental block is when you start to look at the dives in terms of targets and numerically, which is obviously very easy to do because it's a, it's a very measurable sport. Um, but you almost learn more from failure than you do from success. So every time you stumble you have to tweak it and then learn from it and change it for the next time. So um, it really depends on how you look at it and, and keep, keep yourself optimistic. Of course. I think your mind can be your greatest ally as much as it can also on some days be your greatest enemy. <laughs> you have to be very gentle with yourself, otherwise you wouldn't learn much at all. You're just constantly frustrated with it. So um, it is a, an odd sport. The more you relax, the better it will it'll be. Uh, some of the guys were calling me the, the king of uh, relaxation because I was really able to let go of, uh, of any, any thoughts, uh, let go of any tension in my body so I could really relax. It was amazing to learn how to do that. today lacks a bit of challenge in their life and free diving definitely gives gives this little challenge and quickly can become also in a, an addiction and a lifestyle um, so this is what happened to me like free diving literally changed my life um, I have to say in Brittany in France so um, I always have been close to the coast I always uh, had this connection with the water since I'm little really things have started to become a bit more uh, advanced when I arrived in Malta and I had this amazing clear water 30 meters plus visibility while I was snorkeling I was like Whoa, why why don't I go and visit those shipwrecks so I started to go a bit deeper and deeper with my friends. We started to discover uh, shipwrecks, going uh, snorkeling. And um, it's really easy to, to access them once you start getting uh, to deeper depth than 10 meters. You, you start really to have really interesting things to see. Uh, reef, caves, uh, statues, shipwrecks. Uh, the life underwater starts to be a bit more active. Holding your breath, feeling, feeling uh, connected with, uh, with the sea, um, having this uh, inner peace is uh, priceless. <laughs>